welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. The Burmese military has again overthrown the democratic government in Myanmar. What is the future of the government and how should democracy advocates respond? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. On February 1st, 2021, the Burmese military called the Katmada overthrew the democratically elected government in Myanmar. Longtime political dissident Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested along with the leadership of the ruling National League for Democracy. On today's show, we examine the causes of the coup and what it means for the national democracy in the nation, as well as regional security and democratization. Our guests are Jonathan Lilibad, who is the senior lecturer at the Australian National University. He's the author of a forthcoming book chapter, The Prospects for Amending Myanmar's 2008 Constitution in its Transition to Democracy, and Democracy, Rule of Law, and Legal Ethics, Directing Lawyers to Support Democratization in Myanmar. Kosal Poff is Associate Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Master's Program in International Affairs and Global Justice at Brooklyn College City University of New York. He's the author of the book, Vietnam Strategic Thinking During the Third Indochina War. And Sinu Tian Nielsen, visiting scholar in the anthropology department at UCLA and senior research scientist for the Foundation for Psychocultural Research. She's the author of Healing Our Sacrifice, Trauma and Translation in the Burmese Democracy Movement. So Professor Lilliabad, could you give us a description of the events that led up to and what's been happening in Myanmar since the coup. The way to sort of understand uh, the events of the past week is we would have to trace back ostensibly to about the 2008 constitution and the tensions that have resulted because of the, uh, the, co- the terms of the constitution. So just very briefly, the 2008 constitution uh, created a uh, political system where uh, there's apportionment in the legislature reserved for the military. So the uh, military, which is known as the Tatmadaw, uh, retains 25% of the seats in both chambers of the legislature, uh, the Hlata. And in addition, uh, the military retained uh, control uh, over three ministries. So it was the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, the Ministry of, uh, regarding Border uh, Control, and then also um, the military forces themselves. In addition to this, And there was a section in the constitution dealing with emergency powers that the military uh, had an avenue uh, to go ahead and uh, seize control of the government. And so through this is the uh, famous article 417 that's been mentioned in in the press and the media in various circles, where uh, if the president declared a state of emergency that the military could then uh, uh, resume power and take over executive, legislative and judicial functions. So what occurred in the events leading up to uh, this past February was that there's been ongoing tensions between the civilian government, which is led by the National League for Democracy, which is uh, Dong San Suu Kyi's uh, political party, um, in particular, between the NLD and the military. And in particular, it dealt with the issue about amending uh, the political system and uh, enabling a wider uh, slate of reforms. Uh, because of the re- continuing position of the military and the government, uh, as a result of the constitution, um, the uh, availability of reforms was severely constrained and, and the NLD had been working within the past few years to try and find avenues to accelerate and expand the reforms in the country. In addition to this, there's been commentaries by various journalists about the personality clashes between Dong San Suu Kyi herself and the leader of the Tatmadaw, uh, General Min Ong Klein, that uh, the two of them personally did not get along, that there had been documented arguments between them. They had stopped talking to each other, as a matter of fact. And then since 2017, uh, the NLD and Dong San Suu Kyi had stopped convening what's called the National uh, Defense Council. And uh, basically, this was an indication that the military was being marginalized. The arguments of the military regarding February 1 and the reason it took the actions it did was that uh, they alleged, similar to the United States, that there was widespread voter fraud and that there was not a free and fair election. Their arguments centered around the fact that there were, you know, polling stations had been closed in certain areas or they'd been restricted. In addition to that, that the voting lists uh, were fraudulent, that there were fake lists of voters or fake voters. 
the NLD, uh, which was in control of the Union Election Commission, uh, had reviewed those um, allegations and had found that uh, there was no basis to them. And then as a result, um, the military said that uh, there was a state of emergency. So they uh, bypassed the Constitution by simply uh, arresting the President, Wu Win Min, and then arresting Dong San Suu Kyi, and then in placing their own president. Uh, so this is the current uh, Wu Min Sui, who was promoted from his position as vice president to president, and then Wu Min Sui to declare a state of emergency and hand power to the military. Since that time in the past week, there's been a growing civil disobedience movement. You can see on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, even on YouTube, that uh, citizens have been uh, mobilizing. They've been trying to avoid uh, street protests because their arguments or the, uh, that they charge that the military is looking for an excuse to use the same kind of tactics that they used in two, 1988 and 2008. And so this time the, the, the citizens are protesting or seeking to protest through alternative means and in the process trying to um, appeal for international assistance. Um, in addition to that, there's been uh, civil disobedience by the medical profession. So doctors and nurses are refusing to provide medical treatment. There's also been civil disobedience from um, a number of the lower level uh, ministries in the various parts of the country where you have office workers who are refusing to work or not coming to work. And then there's also, uh, even though the members of parliament were initially arrested and then released, there's a continuing number that continue to occupy their places in Napidaw, the nation's capital, and they've been attempting to convene uh, Zoom meetings uh, in the interim. So that's essentially where we are at this point right now. Now, Professor Pop, I know the implications for the region are actually quite dramatic, both the concerns for refugees, people fleeing the conflict within the country, and also for democratization throughout Southeast Asia. What do you see as, as those implications and, and how might neighboring countries respond? Well, of course, you know, in my view, uh, the Tatmadaw's hostile takeover to the civilian government in a well-planned uh, military coup against the democratically elected National League for Democracy is not actually unpredictable, much less a surprise. You know, when I visited uh, the University of Manila in June 2018, so I got a chance to talk to professors, students, and I actually I gave a lecture about my book on the role of the Vietnamese military and the Communist Party of Vietnam. The response I got and during my conversation with them, so one of the main questions is about the role of military in uh, Myanmar's uh, national politics. And they were very concerned about the resiliency of the military power uh, of the, the Tatmadaw. And what happened on February 1st, as sad as it is, it has major implication on the region. It's a painful and depressing experience for, for the people of Myanmar uh, now thinking about going back to the kind of you know, life under the military rule um, and the economic sanction imposed by the West. And so this seems to be sort of the, the old chapter that accepts that it's sort of uh, when people taste the you know, real experience of democracies and then you know, got suspended, so it couldn't be really, really bad. But originally, I think that has major implication on ASEAN itself. You know, I'm not quite optimistic about ASEAN uh, as a, a regional grouping and it responds uh, to the military coup in Myanmar. I mean, we all know, you know, ASEAN, uh, they champion this norm of non-intervention internal affairs of the member states, peaceful dialogue. Yes, a lot of peace, but very depressing. To be honest with you, very stressful. Uh, this is the time I think that the ASEAN has to uh, to respond in a more forceful way. If you look at what happened immediately after the coup, uh, only three countries, three members of the ASEAN uh, grouping, namely you know Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, uh, who came out uh, came short of condemning uh, what happened in Myanmar. Uh, they didn't even call it a coup, but it's expressed concern about what happened and proposed. Uh, perhaps a reconciliation between the conflicting parties. Uh, Cambodia, Prime Minister Hun Sen said very clearly that, uh, you know, this is internal affairs of uh, Myanmar. So basically he's simply saying, you know, this is sort of the, uh, the norm, the principle, one of the most important principles of ASEAN is non-intervention in domestic affairs of another member state. Of course, uh, we have Vietnam, Laos, um, Brunei, Brunei is an autocrat, Vietnam is a communist party. Uh, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chak just got elected for the third time. They made a special case for him to be the third, to the chief uh, of the party for the third time. 
Laos. So all these ASEAN state, a group of um, authoritarians uh, of different kinds. So they're not particularly interested uh, in coming out forcefully against uh, an attack. Clearly, this is an attack on democracy. So I'm not very optimistic about, about ASEAN in, in this case. But one important thing I want to make is that this is clearly a violation of the ASEAN Charter, right? Because ASEAN Charter enshrined the principle of democracy, the rule of law, the fundamental freedoms. And the Charter, if you look at the model of the Charter, is they sort of they put out there, right? One vision, one identity, one community. But here in this case, they have not spoken out in one voice as a sort of in unity against what clearly a violation of the UN Charter, UN's, uh, uh, sorry, the ASEAN Charter, ASEAN commitment to the sort of collective community, so there's a sense of V feeling, right? So there's no V feeling here. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a major disconnect, but I thought also think it's a good opportunity for ASEAN to come out, you know, and to begin the process of perhaps thinking about stripping Myanmar of, uh, under the military rule, un, you know, of its membership. I think that's the least it can do. Uh, to actually to show if they're serious about, you know, pushing the ASEAN Charter and, and to achieve the ideal dream of becoming sort of a collective community, you know, a shared value, because there has to be uh, a much more forceful um, a commitment uh, to this rule of laws and democracy. So that, I, I think, I want to say another point, though. I think in terms of the, the response uh, from, from the West, this is what I think to me, I think it's going to be more important because democracy has been under attack for, for since 9 11, uh, since 2001, I mean, over two decades ago. So it has been under attack, constantly under attack. The Biden administration seemed to have more interest in Southeast Asia, right? To the idea of to re engage Southeast Asia. And this is where I think the Biden administration will have more influence in shaping uh, the uh, regional interests. Uh, in taking democracies and the rule of law and the you know fundamental freedom seriously, because ASEAN are in deep economic crisis. You, know, you look at the data, right? So three, the economic growth as a region, ASEAN has dropped from um, uh, you know two three point minus three point three. So that's a major economic crisis uh, on top of other social economic issue uh, caused by the uh, COVID nineteen. So I think uh, if the Biden understanding is serious about, you know, making America, you know, uh, to be a globally responsible, increase American gl global responsibility and promote democracies and human rights. I think this is the area where I think the Biden understanding should uh, look into and, and take a serious uh, step toward uh, punishing the military junta in, the, in Myanmar. And, and, and I think if they don't do this, forget about talking about genocide, uh, in Hong, uh, in, in, you know, against the Uyghur by the Chinese Communist Party, you know, in Xinjiang province, forget about the mark, uh, democracies in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Because this is really, the Tamanau has double crossed the international community. One is the ethnic cleansing, uh, some even call it genocide against the Rohingya people. And now it's a violation of the basic principle uh, of, of, of democracy, a democratically elected uh, a government. I mean, it's uh, the norm of national sovereignty does not apply here because well, of course, the military are going to say that they simply didn't want to enforce the constitution of 2008. But again, you know, that constitution was basically designed to keep them in power, uh, you know, designed to give them the veto power. If they don't like the election, they're going to say, well, we're going to take it over and rewrite the constitution. So this is the, I, if I remember correctly, the third constitution. Perhaps they want to write another constitution to make sure the result of the election will, 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 will be to their satisfaction. So that's not... Uh, how democracy work, and I think it's really it, they they can't claim the idea of so this is a this national sovereignty issue. This is really I think it's illegal government that you are seeing here in uh, Myanmar. You're listening to Scholar Circle. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing the political conditions in Burma, Myanmar, following the military coup. Professor Chenyi Samyotsen. Your work has focused on a topic I'm particularly interested in, in some of my own research, and that's the role of trauma. And, and certainly the history, certainly the recent history, and perhaps the uh, post-colonial history in this nation has been you know, quite traumatic. In what ways is this coup representative of this ongoing human rights challenge this country faces? And sort of conversely, the way in which the population might respond in a demand for a return to democracy, and 
you know, some way to, to deal with and, and end this trauma? So I, I think in order to understand the trauma in terms of the history, yes, it, it's in part about the 2008 constitution, but you actually have to reach much further back. You actually have to reach back certainly to 1988, uh, but all the way back to 1962, and then, you know, I, I won't reach back further back than 1962, but like the parliamentary era and uh, the colonial era. But in 1962, there was a coup by General Nguyen. He was, you know, very firmly placed. He essentially elevated the Burmese military. I mean, it always had a, played a central role, but uh, Nguyen expanded both the um, surveillance and infrastructure inside the country and as well as sort of the infrastructure of the military. And then in 1987, was when there was like a very nascent uh, student movement started at both the University of Yangon and at RIT, the Rangoon Institute of Technology. And in 1988, there was a series of events. And that's really when sort of the democracy movement took hold. And this became sort of a national movement, initially led by students, but also politicians such as Aung San Suu Kyi sort of eventually joined the movement as well. And there were histories of atrocities throughout 1988 as they contested, you know, for power with the military state. There's a popular people's uprising uh, that culminated on August 8th, 1988. There were tens of thousands that were killed. You know, for a period of time, it seemed that the popular uprising had actually succeeded and the military actually withdrew for a period of time after those massacres. But then um, in September, they came back. They essentially shot everyone off the streets. And, you know, tens of thousands, once again, in the country died. And there's been no sort of a documentation or record, records of this. All the bodies are cremated. When I talk about these atrocities, and when I talk about sort of um, the leadership that initially led the democracy movement, including the student leaders, they're the same people who are in the NLD government now. Many of them were imprisoned. There's a huge diaspora out of Burma, and many of them ended up in other parts of the world. But for the most part, for those who survived the prisons, who, who survived the massacres, the NLD government is, is essentially started with that student movement in 1988, uh, what, what we know as sort of the, the, we call it the 1988 uprising. And then there was a, um, an election in 1990. You know, by then the National League for Democracy had been formed. Um, and once again, the military did everything in its power to try to win this election, including um, threatening, harassing, intimidating NLD members, uh, trying to prevent them from campaigning. Um, and yet the NLD in 1990 also won by a landslide. My uncle was part of that. My uncle was actually elected into parliament um, as a member of the National League for Democracy with Aung San Suu Kyi in 1990. So he was one of the people. And you know what did they do in 1990? Uh, when, when the NLD won the landslide election, rather than honoring the results of the election, uh, they came and they rounded everyone up. They took everyone in parliament, including my, who had been elected into parliament, and they placed them in, um, them in prison. They rounded up all the student leaders of, of the democracy movement, pay, placed them in prison. So they did this in 1990, and then it, it was, you know, 27 years of military rule. And then around... 2013 was when they indicated that they were going to sort of transition, maybe closer to 2010. That's when they officially, the, I believe the military officially dissolved. But the, that 2008 constitution was essentially written with all the other um, main players, um, including Aung San Suu Kyi, including uh, members of the 88 generation, and many other groups imprisoned. So the military wrote that constitution on their own while they had um, imprisoned their political opponents, essentially. And they wrote it um, along their own terms. That, that's why it's not quite sufficient to say, okay, well, it begins with the 2008 constitution. There's a long history you know, before that. And then they wrote that 2008 constitution around 2010. Um, it seemed like they were indicating that they wanted to transition. By then they had formed you know, a political party and organization known as the Solidarity and Development Party. And this was essentially the Union um, Solidarity and Development Party is that essentially basically was the, officially declared to be a political party, but it was essentially something, it was taken from an apparatus that had existed uh, during the era of Slork or the military era, which resembled very much the sort of the, the socialist era in terms of its apparatus. So it was essentially uh, sort of the civil society wing of the military uh, dictatorship, right? So this was the, the wing that was in all the neighborhoods, that everyone in the neighborhoods were sort of forced 
uh, to sign up for. They worked with, there's something called, and still exists, USDP Youth. So it's actually, in Burma, it's called, um, you know, quite ironically, in the, in the military era, it was called a non-governmental governmental organization. Right. It's like very, very, very strange and very Orwellian name. Right. That's what it served as. And they took that structure and they turned it into a political party. It was the, the structure that educated and socialized youth. People were forced to join. Um, they often it was that organization that would often um, harass members of the uh, National League for Democracy when they engaged in forced relocations. It was um, that organization that would sort of bring in uh, men of violence to chase people out of the neighborhoods uh, that they wanted to essentially, where they wanted to seize property. I think what I'm trying to communicate is that there's this very long history of one, um, essentially the, something that you can conceptualize as certainly one community, the National League for Democracy and the community of what are really now former political prisoners in Burma, their families, their supporters. So this political group um, that's been consistently sort of um, subjected to political violence, political atrocities, um, human rights abuses. And when they finally went into an election again in 2015, um, once again, I think the military had put everything, they felt that they had put everything in place where they would win. And I think they had told the entire the international community that they would win. So whereas the uh, National League for Democracy had es essentially spent the last 27 years with the vast majority of their membership and their political leaders in prison and all the families struggling to support these individuals in prison, having suffered multiple trauma, that um, the USDP, meanwhile, you know, sent their own youth abroad, um, you know, had built up all this infrastructure all around Burma. So they felt confident that they would win. And in 2015, they went into it very, very, very confident. And there was another landslide victory for Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, amazingly, they transferred over power, you know, in 2015. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, it's, it's not something that you can kind of um, analyze and only look at starting from 2008. And that this, this history of one group, one political group um, being targeted um, by this military reaches very far back. And it's interesting that the discourse um, of trauma um, and the discourse of genocide and political atrocities in Burma, especially the discourse of genocide, is used for uh, groups like the Rohingya. But we don't necessarily think of this political group and what's happening to them as yeah. genocide. And that, that's a very specific aspect of the genocide uh, convention, actually, um, yeah. that they excluded political groups from that. Yeah. Um, so um, I would actually make the argument that what they've done to the National League for Democracy, their supporters, um, and that entire community um, can be argued to be a form of genocide, just like the 1965 killings in Indonesia were a form of genocide. And that's also contested because it was target, the, the targeted group uh, was a political group uh, rather than a religious, ethnic, ethnic or racial, uh, racial group. So, so, you know, in, in terms of the sort of the history of trauma um, in Burma and the trauma of, of these recent events, it's sort of, um, it's something that um, has a very identifiable pattern. And, it, and that pattern is that there's an identifiable perpetrator that's been targeting essentially this one community, this one political group. Hmm. And by my observations as an anthropologist, um, a cultural group. Uh, because I, for the last uh, seven years, I've actually been spending time uh, with this community of former political prisoners um, and democracy activists. Um, I saw them go into office in 2015 when I first met uh, some of them. Um, so I met uh, President Uwe when he first came out of prison. I remember sitting with him um, like in a tea shop in Napidal and him not knowing how to use a cell phone because he'd been in prison for, <laughs> for so long. And Dr. Zamiet Mound from, you know, the Central Executive Committee, he, he, I think he'd been in prison for 20 years or 21 years and he came out and, you know, they, they'd never seen a cell phone before. So I think that that's a, that those are very important points to keep in mind in terms of sort of uh, the dynamics of trauma. Now, Jonathan, a lot of this, the contemporary commentary, particularly in the United States, has really position this is this is Aung San Suu Kyi versus the military. What we've been hearing so far is that Aung San Suu Kyi really, she represents groups within Myanmar, but this really isn't necessarily a 
a personal battle as much as it's a, a much deeper battle. Is, is that accurate? And what exactly is the role she's playing in this political drama? Well, things are always more complex than you know what's given in the news media, right? And there's a there's a much deeper context behind this. And you know, yeah, absolutely, things go way earlier than the 2008 Constitution. But you know, just you know, the current discussions and the discourse that's playing out. Uh, relates to the Constitution, but very much that there's a longer historical context. And, um, and incidentally, this is one of the issues I don't think uh, the international community quite understands. And I think that, um, you know, this is part of why ASEAN is potentially making a strategic miscalculation about um, the issues regarding uh, Myanmar. So Dong San Suu Kyi, this is something that the international community probably isn't aware of, but, you know, she's the daughter of the father of the country, but he was also the founder of the Tatmadaw. And so there's sort of this, you know, long uh, going complex relationship. And, you know, this is, these, this is something that she had played up uh, and, and, and talked about uh, following the 2015 elections. Um, and it was part of this discourse is, you know, there's, you know, the international community criticized Aung San Suu Kyi for trying to be an apologist for the military, particularly in relation to the Rohingya crisis and particularly with uh, with the events that happened with the ICJ um, uh, and the hearings there. Um, but this was, you know, this, there was an ongoing connection there at that point in time. However, uh, people needed to be aware that in Myanmar, um, there's also um, a question about um, centripetal versus centrifugal forces. So, you know, a lot of the writings that I've written about point to the fact that the idea of Myanmar is something that's a construct of the colonial era. And it's something that the British had sort of created and then it was you know something that existed in 1948 but even at that time that there were various components of um, the region that wanted sovereignty they wanted independence and so you know as a result there's been ongoing civil war uh, since that time and so you know we're talking about trauma and this is one of the things that people uh, various you know academics and journalists have noted that if you go through the country that you're dealing with a population that you know, is essentially you know, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder because it's had multiple generations of conflict that never went away. Um, and so this is something that's persisted. And even now uh, you have situations where um, the country, there are parts of the country that uh, are continuing to be conflict zones, right? And that they don't, they actually want to disassociate themselves uh, from um, the union, you know, it's called the Union of the Republic of Myanmar. And so it's a question, there's this, you know, so you have these tensions that are trying to tear the country apart, but then also attempts to try and pull the country together. Um, and this is also incidentally part of the reason why uh, the region, it's a huge issue because you get the, you get the diaspora, but it's not a diaspora necessarily going to the West. There's also migrant outflows that are going to South Asia, also going to Southeast Asia, specifically Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and anytime there's a situa situation of instability, anytime there's an intensification of conflict, you're gonna get these increases in migrant flows out of the country. And so it's actually, it increases the stress uh, on place on the neighboring, on, on Myanmar's neighbors or Burma's neighbors. Um, and so it's something that I think that they, for them, for anyone in ASEAN or any ASEAN leader to say that this is purely an internal matter, I think overlooks the fact that there are very severe consequences that percolate outward. The other issue that's ongoing um, and this is where I think uh, the West does start to become involved, um, is that uh, Myanmar is uh, subject uh, to a proxy, a proxy conflict between um, China, India. There's also been presence uh, and activities from Russia, as well as you know, various Western countries um, struggling. Uh, Myanmar or Burma does hold a geostrategically critical location on the Indian Ocean. Um, that there are uh, efforts to try and uh, gain control by various, uh, you know, uh, international entities for deep sea port as well as air bases inside the country. Um, and so that there are these tensions that are, that are playing out. What's not helping the situation in Myanmar, and, and the, again, for the international communities so to help you understand, uh, because, of the, because of the decades of conflict, um, this has resulted in a loss of the peace dividend. And so without a peace dividend, there's no infrastructure, there's no organization, there's problems with the rule of law, uh, there are problems of education, there's problems with development. And uh, with that kind of an environment, 
Um, there's a massive uh, illegal trade um, in narcotics, in uh, timber, endangered species, human trafficking, um, and basically, and all of these different types, types of illegal trade are actually connected together because they actually have, uh, UNODC has extensive documentation on this about criminals, uh, multinational uh, criminal syndicates that are engaging in cross-sectoral illegal trade. And a lot of it is coming through Myanmar. Um, you know, in addition, I also should mention gemstones. That's another major area of, of, of illicit activity. So these are issues that have compounded things. So uh, Dong says she, when she was elected, um, she, get, she did, uh, the NLD did gain a massive amount of support in the 2015 election. They actually increased the margin of victory in this past election. So that, you know, they, they had more than, uh, uh, more than 80% of the seats in the parliament. So it was close to forming, I mean, the ones that were available for, uh, to be contested had more than 80% 80 of the seats. Um, and I think that, uh, Politically, uh, for the USDP and the Tatmadaw, Tat this was um, a, this was not the scenario that they had envisioned, right? And um, just a contextual thing, just to sort of connect into some of the previous conversation we just had. Uh, the idea of having a military presence in a civilian government is not new to Asia. This is something that um, was done in Indonesia under the Suharto regime. It's something that's being done now in Thailand. So, you know, for ASEAN, the rest of Southeast Asia, this is the reason why I think they're not alarmed by the idea of military uh, involvement in the government. They think that this is, you know, this is, they've seen it before. Um, but, you know, my position is that I don't think that they're cognizant of the instabilities that are inside the country and that, you know, Myanmar is, is a fragile state. And, you know, to reference some academic discourses, um, by having a a combined civilian military uh, regime in, in terms of the constitution. Um, this falls in the category of what democratization scholars reference as hybrid regimes. And um, there was an extensive study done, commissioned by the United States government near the end of the 1990s. It was the um, State Failure Task Force. And one of the, you know, they went through more than 140 different uh, regimes around the world. And they found that hybrid regimes are actually uh, uh, more unstable. In fact, they're the highest category of instability among different kinds of uh, political regimes in the world and that they don't tend to last very long. So either a hybrid regime will, will go back to being pure authoritarian or they'll somehow uh, proceed to being a fully democratic state. So Myanmar was never in a stable situation with the current constitution. It was really in a situation that was incredibly fragile and we're kind of witnessing what a lot of democratization scholars uh, predicted was going to happen with this kind of a system that, it, that you know that there's going to be a change at some point, uh, particularly when you have an incumbent uh, regime, primarily the military, that has a vested interest in maintaining its position and has to respond or it's going to respond when it feels that its interests are threatened, and that's essentially what's played out. Um, you know, Larry Diamond. Um, I, I like to reference Larry Diamond quite a bit because um, he's written some things that I do agree with regarding Myanmar, and it's, it's consistent with the things that I've seen. It's, it's, um, and just full disclosure, you know, I've been going into the country since 2014 and engaged in uh, various capacity building programs. Um, and he said that, you know, Myanmar, it's a fissiparous state, right? And it's a fragile state. And um, there are multiple factions around the perimeter of the country that are not entirely allied and uh, buying into this idea of a unified Myanmar. They have their own interests and their own agendas. And this is something that Dong Sun Shi has been contending with. And this is the reason why the Tatmadaw has never been able to pacify the country entirely. Um, it doesn't help that there's, um, you know, multinational criminal networks involved. It doesn't help that there's these huge diaspora outflows. It doesn't help that there's ongoing conflict. And so it's a situation that um, for the larger international community, they have to recognize that this is, um, it's not a situation where anyone can see it as a proxy with an assured outcome and that there's no such thing as a pure geopolitical transaction with this kind of an environment. What there is instead is very much an unstable situation. And unstable situations are bad for geopolitics, it's bad for international business, it's bad for everybody, including particularly specifically the people inside the country, that there's ongoing conflict. Now, Kassal, you've made a, a strong case, actually everybody has, you made a particularly strong case for the need for some form of international intervention in confronting this coup. What's the likelihood of 
uh, ASEAN countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation countries, in supporting what I would see as the likeliest international intervention, which would be U.S.-led or European-led sanctions against the country. I know there's been opposition to the use of sanctions in the region in the past. Would there be support for that, or, or would the U.S. really find itself with quite a bit of opposition from its Southeast Asian partners? I think that's a very central question going forward. What we're going to do about this, right? So for ASEAN, for United Nations, European Union, United States, uh, the question is what uh, the way forward. Well, first, you know, the Biden administration tried to up, you know, diplomacy, right? Diplomacy re-engage ASEAN, and it's going to be one of the central problems. It's not just the ASEAN issue. I think for ASEAN's uh, mediation to work in this case, meaning that you know, getting. Uh, the military, the Tatmada leadership to the negotiating table with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy, for that to happen for Indonesia, for example, Indonesia can play a more effective role in that sense. It has to be some pressure from the international community. By international community, I'm talking about the UN Security Council. If the UN Security Council fail to come to um, a resolution, a strong resolution, and I expect that it might be, you know, it may be dead on arrival because, United, because China is going to veto it, because they threatened to veto it already. So if the UN Security Council failed to come into a strong resolution to condemn and to take concrete actions against the, the Tamadar, then uh, the economic sanction. For economic sanction to work, in this case, I think it has to be very targeted sanctions against the military. And the military, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the military, but from what I know, they have the ministry almost like the, the economic ministry inside the security apparatus. This is quite similar to what happened in Vietnam. I mean, the Ministry of Defense in Vietnam very powerful. They almost have an independent financial coffer, banking system, telecom, and so forth. I see the same thing in Myanmar. The military has the you know tentacles, uh, branches of businesses everywhere. So I'm not very hopeful if you just put a lot of hope on ASEAN, because for ASEAN mediation to work, there has to be external pressure so that the military know that this can escalate to some kinds of intervention, which not going to be good for them, right? Because they have double crossed the international community on the ethnic cleansing and on the, this, this issue. So I, I think it has to be a kind of real politic kind of response on top of the further with sanctions and so forth, they're going to go into the Chinese orbit. I heard that all the time the same argument with the Cambodian government, the same gov uh, issue that if you put pressures on the Hun Sen government, the Hun Sen government is going to go further in China. It already is in China's orbit. So I think um, it has to be uh, it has to be concrete respond to this because I think diplomacy not going to be enough. I, I think that the military can only understand the language, one language, and that is coercion. I think. See, so, you know, part of what you're describing when you're talking about this communities that have been targeted throughout history in the region, how unified are these groups for some sort of collective action? And is it possible that sort of, you know, people's movements taking to the streets, to, you know, protesting, demanding a return for democracy could be successful? Because external pressure certainly can play a role, but ultimately democratization would need to come from within, wouldn't it? The democracy movement itself was actually quite, in, in many ways, it engaged a large uh, sec section of the Burmese population, right? And the student movement initially even formed strong alliances uh, with different sort of ethnic armies and ethnic organizations, because there's actually, the, in the main part of the country, um, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, you know, had said that this was very specifically a nonviolent movement, which is quite different from, you know, taking up armed insurgency. And there, but there was a wing of the student movement who, who, you know, went out to the border areas, the Chin State, the Kian State, and actually formed these very strong alliances with different ethnic armies. So there, there are these, um, you know, there, there are these existing relationships. I think the unfortunate aspect of the discourse on Burma over the last, um, I would say, 10 years is that, you know, you mentioned trauma. There are these very similar histories and patterns of suffering and trauma um, of multiple groups, the Rohingya, the political activists that I work with, which I, which I, which is a very distinct political group. And really, you know, if you really look at them, not just their, their, their community um, and their families, 
and their uh, the, the political activists themselves, their families, but also look at their supporters and their voting electorate. You're talking about tens of millions of individuals that that a very small, essentially a very small group, the army has been targeting all this time, right? Um, so uh, the unfortunate aspect of the, the of the international discourse is that it doesn't really emphasize the commonalities between these patterns of violence and these patterns of suffering. Um, and so I, I think that that's been one sort of frustrating aspect of it. Um, you know, and I think someone also mentioned sort of instability. So in terms of what's happening right now in Burma, um, you know, I, I mean, um, I, I think it was mentioned that both Aung San Suu Kyi and Uwe Mien, um, you know, in, in, in the early morning hours had been captured. They weren't the only ones. It was essentially all of the, the elected members of parliament, all of the NLD's chief ministers. I mean, at gunpoint, they, they were all, all detained um, and many members of civil society. So you have a situation in Burma right now where, where it, it, it's almost, I mean, it's almost unimaginable. You basically have almost every civil society leader um, basically trying to find safety, right? Pro uh, you know, that the, the, they're, 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 essentially the civil society is wanted by the military and everyone's trying to find safety. Um, they've already just over the last two days, and I think this is probably a, no, um, a low figure, they said there's about 134 illegal detentions. That, does, that didn't include the illegal detentions of uh, Don Sun Suu Kyi, Wu Mien, the chief ministers, the regional, you know, the, um, the, um, the parliament of both the lower house um, and and the and the upper house of parliament. Um, so so this is this is huge. This is a huge amount of instability um, in um, um, in the society. Um, today, um, the National League for Democracy actually announced the international community, um, including the United Nations, um, that um, they that essentially that they are the official government of Myanmar. Right, um, and I'm going to actually read the the statement that they released in the early hours of the morning today. They said, um, you know, that this military coup has not taken away our authority um, and cannot officially deter us from performing the responsibilities um, entrusted upon us by the people. So they've actually formed um, a committee representing um, the the Pidangzi or their their version of par parliament, um, and they are asking the United Nations, the International Parliamentary Union, um, ASEAN. Uh, the ASEAN Inter uh, Parliamentary Organization, um, international parliaments and embassies to communicate with the newly this newly formed committee that represents the legitimate counterpart um, of the Bidan Lifoto. So this is huge. They, they you know, and and you know, it's it's and and in this way, it's it's you know, I was talking about some of the continuities, uh, long-term continuities and patterns of violence and suffering and trauma. This is a distinct discontinuity, and this is how it's different from 1988, because in 1988. Um, you know, there was this people's movement that started, but at the same time, there wasn't um, a functioning government. Once the BSPP collapsed, um, there was, there was, you know, th there was a popular movement and um, leaders within that popular movement, but they didn't have, um, a, a, um, you know, all the structures in place, you know, where they were actually running a, na a nation state. Um, and they do now, they do now. Um, and so this is an entirely different situation. And it seems that um, there, there's actually, um, you know, the military, um, I think one of the other frustrating aspects um, of the discourse on Myanmar is um, certainly, um, you know, some of what I encounter is that it's really dominated by military historians, um, you know, rather than anthropologists or, or anyone else. And so you always get, get these very, very uh, you know, very specific narratives that I think sort of overstate the military's own talking points. Um, so, so um, I, I think the military itself. I think one of the talking points of the military is that it's strong. You know, it's it's it, you know it, it does it, the military itself constitutes a nation state. But over um, you know, I think over the last couple of decades, I think you see the Burmese military becoming more and more fractured um, and struggling to hold itself together on a variety of different levels. Right, and you actually see with this popular movement that that's very visible online right now, uh, with this military coup, uh, many members of both the police force and military coming out in, against this coup. You're listening to Scholar Circle. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing the political conditions in Burma, Myanmar, following the military coup. Now, Jonathan, we're painting a picture now of a weakened military. You had highlighted a fragile state. We've got a government in exile or some sort of alternative government. What immediately comes to mind now, the question is, 
is is this a country that could potentially slide into civil war or civil conflict? And so therefore, certainly regional actors would have to be concerned with massive flows of refugees coming out of the country, if this is the case. Yeah. Based on the information I've been getting out of the country for the past few days, there's three different scenarios that I see happening, each of them having some level of plausibility, but which one ends up playing out depends on some extenuating circumstances. So, you know, the first scenario is that it's, a, what, you know, what I call a hard coup. So, you know, essentially what happened in uh, uh, 1988, you know, 2008, where essentially uh, the military decides they're going to halt everything. They're going to halt all reforms. They're going to halt all development. They're going to halt every, you know, anything that's going on. They're going to freeze the country in stasis um, and focus on pacification. And then, and most importantly, you know, and I think most tragically for a lot of the youth there, they would close off all international flows, trade, travel, et cetera. Um, there, I mean, so, you know, there's some plausibility for this because obviously there's a generation of leadership and that that's all they know. And that they, you know, they grew up from that time period. They grow, grew up with that training. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's what they understand in terms of the way things are supposed to be done. The second scenario is, I would use the term a soft coup, and this is where you get sort of this Thai style uh, system where it's a, it's a military government that maintains a position where they want development, but they control the manner and pace of development. They control what's going on. They maintain um, economic benefits or economic uh, positions for themselves in the system and also as well as political power in the system. And then uh, beyond that, they, they attempt to maintain full international engagement with full international travel as far as possible. Um, now, the, plausible, there, the basis for that, you can see it. This is, I think this is what was attempted with the 2008 constitution. And I think this was uh, the idea that was, that was originally intended. And I think this is the reason why you know, a lot of the news media say that they're kind of befuddled by this coup because uh, the, the, the top model had everything that they wanted. They were in government. They had the they they were they they had the control of the economy. They controlled the major banks, the major corporations, the industries. They were getting international trade and investments. They were you know their interests were being protected. So then why you know do this? Um, the third scenario that's playing out uh, that may play out. Sorry, is that uh, it's basically a miss, directionless where you have different factions of the military um, struggling to figure out what they want to do. The only reason I, I kind of mentioned this is because uh, at the moment, there, there is a growing number. If, like, there are viral postings of a growing number of, uh, of military officers and soldiers who are saying that you know, they're not entirely pleased with this. Uh, even within the embassy in Washington, DC, uh, the Myanmar embassy, there was, there was one member of the embassy who resigned. So it shows that there's not a, there's not a monolithic presence uh, uh, in control of the situation. You know, another example of this is that after they arrested um, everyone in the Hutta or the parliament, they then said, oh, after several days, they said, okay, you can go home, um, which was like, you know, what's, and then, you know, then, then they like, they shut down Facebook, reopened Facebook, shut down uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, reopened Instagram and Twitter. So it's sort of like, what's going on um, now? Which of these scenarios ends up playing out? Um, there are some things that are different this time compared to the previous situations. And I'll add to what um, um, uh, Sinenu had, had mentioned is that uh, because it's the 21st century, uh, there's a population that has now uh, far more sophisticated regarding telecommunications technology. Um, they've had 10 years now of access uh, to internet, being able to communicate. They've also had a greater level of mobility in terms of travel. They're aware of the outside world. Um, in previous uh, situations in 1988, uh, they, you know, the, the Tatmadaw, they, they trucked in or ferried in soldiers from the periphery who were not aware as to what was happening in urban environments. And so, you know, when young men are told that there's a national security threat, young men are going to do what they always do. They're going to shoot first and ask questions later. And this is sort of what happened in 1988. This time you've got a situation where more members of the Tatmadaw have seen the outside world and say, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's not what we have been told is out there. Um, and you kind of see it that uh, this time in contrast to previous uh, coups, um, it was live streamed. Like, you know, normally in the past the military just took over and then later told everyone we're in control um, and then there wasn't any way of having an alternative message being put out over the radio, television, et cetera. This time, 
people, like uh, members of the parliament were actually live streaming their own arrests. We were watching it live. So there was no way for anyone to deny what was happening. And it was also meant that there was an alternative message getting out. Um, now, part of this increasing level of sophistication is that uh, a lot of uh, people in Myanmar, or Burmese civil society, as well as the government, they now have more education. They're much more sophisticated regarding international law, international politics. They're aware as to like this, the issues about getting uh, recognition by the state, as Nadu had alluded to, the significance of that. They're aware of, 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 of the way things work in terms of like trying to sway public opinion and other democratic societies. Um, they're also aware, incidentally, of how to sway shareholders um, with respect to corporations, which I think probably played a role in the latest wave of, of uh, corporations backing out of Myanmar. So you've had the, uh, the Thai uh, corporation Amata uh, announced they were pulling out. You had Kieran, the Japanese Kieran, announced they were pulling out. And I think this was uh, not because of their governments, but I think this was more of a response to their investors and shareholders that were feeling some level of awareness as to what was happening internally. So I think that there are these things that may make a difference this time, but we're gonna have to monitor the situation going forward. I'll ask both of you, Kasal and Tinu, this, this question. It seems like the main difference highlighted you know, by Jonathan and, and kind of like to drive this point home, is international pressure, international attention, and the ability for the opposition to get the message out, get these narratives out. Let's we'll start with you, Kassel, and finish with Lucina. How effective can international pressure be in trying to change this scenario from what it seems to be, to be a pattern? Is there an opening here where international uh, actors, citizen groups as well, you know, civil society, businesses, and governments can have a say? I see two tracks. First, it has to be diplomacy, but diplomacy has to be backed by coercive, coercive measure by the West and the international community. Because, uh, you know, as Jonathan and Sinu you know, talked about this, you know, um, so what we learn is that the Thai law is very resilient, very resilient. The economic power, I mean, they're more like a corporate culture, I mean, they're very wealthy, you know. I've seen this in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos too. So these military men are very wealthy. You can impose sanctions on what you want. You know, they're not going to, you know, they've been through it for many, for many years. So I think it, you cannot do the same and expect different results. So diplomacy this time has to be backed by, by sticks, by coercion, uh, by threats. Um, I don't say this lightly because, you know, uh, we've seen it all over, you know, in many scenarios, right? It's happened in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, in Cambodia. There's the same pattern about sanctions. We talk about sanctions against North Korea, Iran. Um, this is, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, it's going to, it's going to turn out differently if the same kind of sanction will be imposed, right? Because the EU already imposed some sanctions on, um, on, on Myanmar, on, you know, uh, because uh, the, the trade agreement is tied to human rights and, uh, you know, so of course the violation of human rights and the, uh, the persecution of the ethnic minority uh, would, uh, you know, already allow for, for compel the European to impose sanctions. So it has to be backed by um, I'm going to make it short because I can talk long on this one. Because, but but has to, diplomacy has to be back. If for it to work, has to be backed by, uh, you know, uh, coercive measures. Absolutely, and and so, you know, I, I'll give you the last word. I want to be optimistic. Can we do something uh, to support democracy and to support the population in Burma and in, in Myanmar? I think the first thing that the international community could, should do in unison very loudly, um, which I think the Biden administration has already done, is that really declaring that this is illegal, this is a coup. That was a talking point of the military, that they were saying that they were perfectly allowed to do this with the 2008 constitution. Uh, that's ridiculous. That was a, a ridiculous narrative that they were putting forward. And I'm glad the Biden administration had the sense to come forward and say right away, no, this is definitely a, a legal coup. So that's the first part. The second part is to recognize the NLD government. They released a statement today saying that we are the official government, and they are because they were elected into office. So an, an illegal coup doesn't make this new council that they've declared um, to be legitimate. And certainly the people are expressing, you know, what they already expressed when they went to the polls in November is that they want uh, the National League for Democracy, the government that they they voted in. So I think if we're consistent and say, you know, there, there's not going to be not only no engagement, um, no participation, and no recognition of this government. And you have to be very, very strong. The international community has to be um, very unified and very strong about emphasizing those points. We've been discussing the coup in Myanmar, the prospects uh, for democracy, 
and international reactions that could support democratic forces within that country. Our guests today have been Jonathan Lilliablood, senior lecturer at Australian National University. He's the author of The Prospects for Amending Myanmar's 2008 Constitution and its Transition to Democracy. Kosal Poff is associate professor of political science and chair of the master's program in international affairs and global justice at Brooklyn College City University of New York. He's the author of the book, Vietnam Strategic Thinking During the Third Indochina War. And Sinu Tian Miosin, visiting scholar in the anthropology department at UCLA and senior research scientist for the Foundation for Psychocultural Research. She's the author of Healing Our Sacrifice, Trauma and Translation in the Burmese Democracy Movement. Thank you all very much. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker and Lillian Ng, contributing hosts, Ankine Agassian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers, Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Tim Page and Mike Hurst, engineers and technical support. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.